Thank you, choir, for that great song. And that's why we're here this morning. We're here to praise the Lord. If we're part of the family of God, I believe that we're living in the most exciting days of all of history. Because we're living in the days when Jesus Christ is soon to return. If that doesn't really excite you, then before the service is over today, you need to be here at this altar saying, Lord, I need to be revived again. I need to know that you're coming again. Everything around us pointing to the soon return of Jesus Christ. Exciting days to be alive. Great to be in the house of God this morning. Take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Before I speak this morning, let's ask God's anointing to be upon his word and upon each of us as we listen together what the Spirit says to the church this morning. Father, how I praise you for the good news of the gospel. And truly it is good news. <coughs> good news that the world is not going to always be as it is now. Good news knowing that Jesus our Lord will return. Good news knowing that there will be a day when there will be no more sickness, no more dying. Good news in the fact that there is coming a day when there will be no more violence, no more war, no more crime. Good news knowing that each of us have the privilege of being in God's kingdom. Lord, we believe that day is drawing near. <laughs> everything around us in our world, everything in the scripture points to that fact. Jesus is coming again. So Lord, we rejoice today and we worship you with happy thanksgiving from deep within our hearts. There was a well of joy knowing that we are on the winning side. Knowing that through Christ there is victory today. Knowing that through Christ there is the ultimate victory. Lord, I pray in these next moments that we spend together, may the Spirit of the living God fall upon every person here. I pray, Lord, that everyone here this morning may sense the presence and the power of God. Speak to our hearts, Lord, and if we need to make commitments, I pray that you'll make that very, very clear to us today. Then, Lord, may we make those commitments that will bring life today and eternal life at the coming again of Jesus Christ. For it is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. One day Jesus was walking with his disciples along the coast of Caesarea Philippi. As he was walking along, he asked his disciples a very important question. He said to them, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Open question. Those in the community and those in the area had witnessed the many, many miracles of Christ. They had watched as he spoke the word and the lame were able to walk. They had watched as he touched the eyes of the blind and immediately they could see. They had watched as Christ touched the lepers, the outcasts of society, and immediately the leprosy was cleansed. They had watched as Jesus stopped a funeral possession and said to a young man, Arise, gave him back to his mother. And now Jesus says to the disciples, who are men saying that I am? And they replied, well, you know, some are saying you're John the Baptist. 
Remember John the Baptist, a great man of God. He's already been beheaded. People are saying, well, there must have been a resurrection, and now John the Baptist is back with great power. Oh, there are others who are saying, well, you know, this must be Elijah coming in power to work great and mighty miracles. Some say, well, you're Jeremiah. And they went on and on with all of these great men of God they were bringing up and saying, surely this man is a miracle worker. Then Jesus said to a disciple, who do you say I am? Who do you say that I am? Let me say to you this morning, the most important question you will ever answer in your life is that question. Who do you say that Jesus Christ is? Many today say he was a good man. He lived a good life. He brought some great principles for us to live by. He was a great man. Who is Jesus Christ according to you? And then that impetuous disciple, Peter gave the answer. Note with me, if you will, verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said unto him, Thou art the Christ, the Son of a living God. That's who you are. You are Christ. You are the Son of a living God. Jesus said to Peter, Well, blessed are you, Peter. Flesh and blood hath not revealed that to you. In other words, that's not something that you gain by deduction. This is something that has been revealed to you by my Father, which is in heaven. Do you know this morning that you cannot profess that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the Son of the living God unless God, by his Holy Spirit, reveals that to you? Oh, you may say, I read in the Bible, and I read the Bible says this about Jesus, but listen. You can never proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord of life, that he is, in fact, the Son of the living God, unless God reveals that to you. <laughs> Jesus said, Peter, you didn't think this up on your own. You saw all of my miracles. You saw all of these things, but you did not come to that conclusion on your own. My Father revealed it unto you. Your future, your destiny, hinges on your answer to that question. Who do you say that Jesus Christ really is? And you cannot say Jesus Christ is a son of the living God. He is my Savior unless God, by his Holy Spirit, speaks to your heart. This is why many times people go to church and they hear the gospel and they come in not a Christian and they hear the gospel and they hear the gospel and they leave the house of God and they never accept Jesus Christ. We say, how can that happen? You cannot accept Jesus Christ until God, by his spirit, speaks to your heart and reveals that Jesus is the Son of the living God. Who is Jesus Christ, according to you? Now, there have been other confessions that he is the Son of God. For example, you remember when Jesus first started calling his disciples? And he called a man by the name of Philip. Philip goes and finds his friend Nathaniel. And he says, Nathaniel, we found the Messiah. And he says, oh, I don't believe that. I don't believe it. Well, that Jesus, he's from Nazareth. And we know that no good thing comes out of Nazareth. And he says, come on, come and see. 
And as Nathaniel and Philip were coming to Jesus, Jesus saw him afar off and began to talk to Nathaniel. And one of the things Jesus said to Nathaniel was, Nathaniel, before Philip <laughs> called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Wow. How can that be? How could Jesus know that? They said, oh, thou art the Son of God. You have to be the Son of God. Look what you're able to do. I know you couldn't see me. You could not know me. And yet, you said you saw me under the fig tree. That's where I was. You saw me. You have to be the Son of God. Think of the time when the disciples were out on the water. A great storm arose on the sea and the ship was tossed to and fro. The Bible says that Jesus came walking to them on the water. And when Jesus stepped up into the boat, immediately the storm subsided. And they said, thou art the Christ. Thou art the Son of God. This time it's different. You see, the other two times that he was proclaimed to be the Son of God, I believe was an emotional response to a miracle. Before something great had happened, something miraculous had happened, and their emotions were stirred, and they said, oh, well, you have to be the Son of God. This time is different. There are no miracles. They're simply walking along the road. And this time it is different. And Peter says, you are the son of God. Jesus, in, in fact, was saying, you're not responding to a miracle now. God has revealed that to you. You know, I believe today there are a lot of people who are not Christian who are simply stirred emotionally. There are people who will see a miracle or something, there will be a high, something that, that creates an emotional high and they'll say, oh wow, this is great. And they will come forward to them and say, yeah, I want to become a Christian. <laughs> they were not touched by God. They were stirred emotionally. I remember one time in the pastor of the church, we had a, a singing at the church on a Sunday afternoon. And the quartet came and they sang and oh, it was great. <clears throat> and it was an emotional experience and everyone was feeling, oh wow, this is great, you know, it's good. Everything's going fine. Everybody was feeling good. <laughs> After the service, I had a lady who spoke to me. She said, you know, I believe if they'd sang one more song, I'd have joined the church. <laughs> Emotionally stirred. People today, there are many times they go to a church and they hear a great message. They're in a place where there's tremendous music and everything builds up and there's a great build up and we're touched emotionally and we're stirred emotionally and we say, yeah, I'll do anything. I'll join the church. I'll do this. Yeah, I'll take it right away. And there is an emotional response. But when the emotion's over, the salvation's over too. At this point, there is no emotion. It's just simply God speaking up. Now, I'm not saying you can't get saved through an emotional service. But what I am saying, that emotional experiences does not necessarily mean that God is speaking to your heart. People can be stirred emotionally to do almost anything. We've learned today that, that we can even determine how fast you will eat by the kind of music that you play. You can go into a restaurant and, and in some of the larger restaurants, and they know that if there's a large crowd there, you gotta get you out and get some more in. The music's a little bit faster. The faster the music, the faster you eat. Get you out of there and get make a group in. If you want to get a slow meal, play slow music and you eat slowly. 
We can be stirred emotionally. And I believe today that there are many who profess to be Christians who have never been born again. God has never spoken to their heart. They have been stirred emotionally. And when the emotional experience is gone, they're gone. This is why you see so many times in churches people making professions of faith and saying, oh yeah, well, I'm on fire for God. Six months later, you can't find him anywhere. Simply an emotional experience. But here, without the emotions, Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let me ask you something. What difference does it really make? What difference does it really make whether Jesus Christ is, in fact, the Son of the living God? What difference does it really make? Well, to give you the answer to that, we've got to go back to the beginning. Go back to the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, we find the answer to why it's important who Jesus Christ really is. You see, back in the book of Genesis, the Bible tells us that God created the world. Beautiful world. God created Adam and Eve and placed them in a beautiful garden called Eden. In a perfect environment. And in this perfect environment, God created them with the possibility of living forever. They could live forever, never have any sickness, no pain, no sorrow, no death. They could live in that garden eternally in a perfect environment, no problems. When Christ placed them in the garden, however, he gave them a commandment. Notice, if you will, the second chapter of Genesis, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, say, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. It's all yours. I've created a good world. I've given it all to you. You can enjoy it. Verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The Hebrew reading there is, in the day thou eatest thereof, in thine thou shalt surely die. Adam and Eve enjoy the blessings of Eden for a time. I don't know how long. The Bible doesn't say. But they enjoyed the Garden of Eden for a time. However, the day came when Adam and Eve, both of their own free will, chose to sin against God. They chose to say, God, I don't believe what you are saying. And of their own free will, they ate of the forbidden fruit. And when they ate of the forbidden fruit, I want you to know part of the judgment. Turn to the third chapter and verse 17. Third chapter, verse 17. This is part of the judgment. God said unto Adam, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. Now notice. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Wow, what a change. All of a sudden, everything changes. Adam and Eve, who had the privilege of living forever, I mean forever, no sickness, no pain, no sorrow. Now it is all changed. God says, listen, because you ate of the tree that I forbid you, I told you way back then, that if you ate of that tree, then in dying, thou shalt surely die. You ate of the tree. Now, therefore, I'm telling you, 
The day is going to come that you are going to die. You came out of the dust of the ground, and when you die, you're going back to the dust of the ground. Listen. Every descendant of Adam and Eve experiences the same judgment. The book of Romans chapter 5, you know when you look at that verse 12, look it up later, tells us that by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death is passed upon all of mankind. We are all descendants of Adam, therefore we all are dying creatures. We don't like to admit that. We don't like to admit the fact that someday we're going to die, but we know it. And the older you get, there are more reminders that that day is coming. Cannot escape it. Everything has changed. Now there is no longer life in the garden. Now there is no longer peace and happiness and health. That's all gone because of sin that came into the world. You know, if that's all there was, wouldn't it be a sad world? If that's all there was, it would be a sad world. I can understand I can understand now when I go back and read the word and study the word, I can understand why there are so many people in our world today who are living without hope. I can understand why so many young people today are literally killing themselves with alcohol and with drugs and with everything else. You know why? What is there to live for? If this is all there is to life, many young people have been brought up in a society that is filled with envy and hatred and violence and they have known in their own life nothing but, but envy and strife and hatred and brutality and they come to the conclusion if this is all there is to it life is not worth living and it's true it's true look at some of the words of some of the popular music today that talks about death as being an escape it's even better than life, and it's true. For many today, death is better than life. They have lived with pain and suffering and torment, and mentally their mind has been confused, and there's nothing there, there is no hope, there's no reason to live. <laughs> I can understand why so many today are dropping out of society. I can understand. Now listen, I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying I can understand. I can understand today young families who say, I don't want to bring children into the world. I don't want to bring them into all of this, this what is happening. I don't want to bring them in. I'd rather have an abortion. And let me just kind of take a little sideline here. Abortion is sin. Abortion is murder. But I'm simply telling you, I can understand that. If this is all there is, if you live a few years and your life is over and that's all there is to it, there's no reason to live. Many who are facing pain and sickness and suffering, if this is all there is, life isn't worth living. Many who have gone through such brutal times in their life. If this is all there is, life is not worth living. And there are so many today. The Bible says in the New Testament, without God there is no hope. Today we're living in a time in America where God is no longer the God of a nation. We're living in a time today, and I can guarantee you that there are people within easy driving distance of this church who have never heard the name of Jesus Christ except in blasphemy. 
There are people living within driving distance of this church who have never ever been in a church. Never ever heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Say, could that be true? Yeah. A lot of people out there go their way. They see the church as something that's just, uh, it's okay. It's okay to go there, but, you know, it's just a club, something nice. And listen, if this is all there is, if you're only going to live 50, 60, 70, 80, even 100 years, if it's all there is and you're going to die and it's all over, life is not worth living. If you go through some pain and suffering and difficulties and emotional stress and your life falls apart, you can easily come to the conclusion, there's no reason to live. This is it. When I die, it's all over. No wonder we're living in such perilous times. No wonder we're living in such violent times when life today isn't worth a nickel. You cannot go out and walk the streets in many cities, even in your own community, sometimes without fear that someone's going to take my life isn't worth a whole lot today. And if this is all there is to it, if today is it, I live today, I live my life, I come to the end, and I come down with sickness and pain and suffering and all of that, and this is all there is. I tell you, there's not much reason to live. <coughs> but there's more. There's more. Thank God there's more. Back to Genesis again. Maybe you're already there. My Bible's got messed up. Let's go to the Genesis third chapter. Verse 14. 3 verse 14. There's more. That's why life's worth living. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, the seed man and woman, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Looks verse 15. And I will put enmity, I will put enmity, you're not going to be able to get along. That means there's going to be a battle, there's going to be hatred, there's going to be division. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. You know what he's talking about? I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. Guess who he's talking about? The devil, the devil here has tempted the woman to sin. The Bible tells us that when Adam and Eve sin, we are all born in sin. We are all born servants to the devil. We are all born in a way that we love to sin. There's not a one here this morning that can't say that you don't love to sin. There are areas in your life that, that the devil knows he can come in and he can tempt you and you say, oh man, I love to do that. We are born with a sin nature. We don't have to be taught to sin. We are born, Jesus said of those his day, you are of your father the devil. When we are born into this world, we're born in sin. We are born the seed of the devil. Now, when a person comes to Christ and are born again, when you are born again, you become a seed of a woman through Christ. Now listen, there should be a great difference between the Christian and the non-Christian. The Bible says here, I will put enmity there's a difference. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman. There's going to be that constant battle. And listen, if you're really serving God, you're not going to get along too well with those who are not serving God. 
If you are willing to stand up and say, I know Jesus Christ, I'm going to live by godly principles, you're going to have problems in this world. And if you're not having problems, there's something wrong in your life because the Bible says it's going to happen. If you claim to be a Christian and you can go out and associate with those who are not Christian and you don't have some problems, you got a problem. God's people are different. We are different. The Bible says there is going to be such a difference. Money will be able to get along together. Now that doesn't mean we can't go out and associate with those who are not Christian. But it does mean that my lifestyle, the way I live, the way I think, the way I act, the way I do is going to be completely different from the non-Christian. It's time for the church of Jesus Christ to become the church and to be different. That doesn't mean weird or strange. That means to become Christ-like. Let's go on. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. What is he talking about? Well, it's going to take me another hour, so I better quit. Pick up here next Sunday. There's so much in this that you need to see and need to hear. Because listen, when I began to read this again and study it again, the Lord just opened my eyes. I said, oh, wow, I know. I see what's going on in the world. I can understand. I understand why people are, are coping out with alcohol and drugs and why so many people want to get their minds so full of dope that they don't know what's going on. Life's not worth living. Listen, if this is all there is, if today is all there is, we can very easily be like those in the, the Bible that says, but eat, drink, and be merry because it's soon going to be all over. Go out, have a blast. Do whatever you can to cover up the fog in your mind. Whatever is hurting you, do whatever you can to cover that up. Whatever you see that you enjoy doing, and I'll tell you what you enjoy doing is sin. All kinds of immorality. Go ahead and do it. Live it up. Do what you want because it's soon going to be over. you got a few years. You're going to get old. You're not going to be able to enjoy these things. Do what you can while you can because life is soon going to be over. And I can fully understand why so many today are at the point they say life is really not worth living. I'd rather be dead if that's all there is. But there's more. There's more. The Lord doesn't come first. I pray that he does. I'm excited about these days. I really am. If the Lord doesn't come first, next Sunday I'm going to continue this. I'm going to show you what he's talking about, what he means. And why it makes all the difference in the world. How you answer the question. Who do you say that Jesus really is? Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful, Lord, that You've given us your word. As we look out into our world and we see all that is happening, the threats of destruction, the threats in our economy, the threats of world hunger and pain and sickness and suffering and death and all of these things that, that are coming up on our world. Lord, we can understand why so many today cannot find life worth living. This is all there is. Then life really isn't worth living. But there's more. There's more. And I'm thankful that you've shown us. I pray, Lord, that even now in these closing moments, <laughs> If there are those here this morning who have never really made a commitment to Christ, maybe they've joined the church, maybe they've gone through all the emotions, and maybe they've even been baptized. But they've never really accepted Christ as Lord of their life. Speak just now, Lord. 
May there be decisions made for Christ and for life and for eternity. <laughs> In Jesus' name. With every head bowed, there may be some here this morning that maybe the scriptures touched you today. Maybe you're coming at that point in your life where you're not really sure the life is worth living. <coughs> maybe you're going through some tough, tough times. You're going through them without Christ. Maybe you've really questioned whether life is worth living. Maybe you need to make a commitment of your life to Christ. You'd like me to pray for you before we sing our closing hymn. If so, just raise your hand and take it down. And I'll pray for you. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Are there others? Father, you have seen every hand that's been uplifted here this morning. Lord, you know every heart. You know the need just now. I pray, Lord, for these hands and for these hearts. I pray that even as we pray together here, that Jesus Christ will be invited into the heart and into the life, that you will give life and hope today and strength. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.